Good evening, friends. It's lovely to see you. Tonight we are continuing our journey in the book of Revelation. And our topic is Revelation's Mysterious Thousand Years Unsealed. Rose was 21 years old in 1920. Sadly, this young lady was living a bad life. It's as if she was just waking up to go to the next party and consume alcohol. Eventually, she was struck down with a disease called encephalitis lethargica, sleeping sickness. She went into a state that the medical personnel were not sure what to do. The one doctor said, well, this is just going to last for a few weeks. Sadly, the weeks became months, and months became years. And this lady was in a position where she was in a wheelchair most of the time, and sitting in, in awkward positions and waiting for death to come. She was in this state for 48 years. 48 years. And then one day, Dr. Oliver Sacks came up with this new drug called L-Dopa, and he administered it to her. And then suddenly her eyes opened. They were blinking. And then, after a few days, she started moving, and she came out of this sleep of 48 years. This was in 1969. But sadly, she was about 70 when she woke up. From the age of 21 to 70. Now she was old, and she aged, and she died. The Bible talks about another great awakening. But this awakening is not just to grow old and die. When we wake up in this awakening, we are going to be young and live forever. John 5 verse 28 and 29 says, Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear His voice and come forth. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. How many resurrections is this verse talking about? It's talking about two, isn't it? The one is the resurrection of life and the other one is the resurrection of damnation. There are two resurrections identified in the Bible. And tonight I want to say this right from the start. Friends, the, the topic of the thousand years unseals the mysteries of the Bible. It's like the missing puzzle piece. My kids, you know, they're not, they're not big. Some of you have seen them. They're little ones like this. They opened a 500-piece puzzle today. 500 pieces. And they started building this thing. And I'm telling you, they can build, eh? But I saw that after a while they'd given up and I went and sat there, and I can't remember when last I touched the puzzle piece. But I was looking around, and I saw he has a crucial little area here. And I started building it, and I couldn't find the one piece. And I hunted, and I hunted. I even prayed. I said, Lord, please help me to find this puzzle piece. And you know, when I found it, it just made that link in this puzzle. And now the puzzle is progressing again. My mom actually said on the phone today that there's a puzzle piece missing there. And it might have been that one that she was talking about, but we found it. You see, the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 20, is like that missing puzzle piece to understand the second coming, to understand the state of the dead, to understand judgment, to understand hell, all those things are linked together by Revelation chapter 20. 
it speaks about two resurrections. The resurrection of life and the resurrection of damnation. When Jesus comes, there's going to be two groups of people. Those who say, behold, this is our God. We have waited for Him. He will save us. And there's the other group that says, let the mountains fall on us. The one group is translated and caught up in the clouds. And the other group is destroyed by the brightness of His coming. The one group, and we need to now hold on to our seats because each group has got two subcategories, the living and the dead, the living and the dead. Are we together? So when Christ comes, the righteous dead are raised and the righteous living are translated. We all meet the Lord in the air. When Christ comes, the wicked living will be destroyed by the brightness of His coming and the wicked dead remain dead. Are we together? Okay, so that's very important to get that from the beginning. And this all happens when Jesus comes on the clouds of heaven and we meet Him in the air. He has a lady dying of cancer. They've done the chemotherapy. They've tried everything they can. But sadly, she's just getting weak and death is near. When she falls asleep in the Lord, the next moment when she wake, wakes up, when she opens her eyes, she'll hear that trumpet sounding. That's the next moment that she'll be conscious of. Death is not something that we need to fear, friends. It's like a deep sleep. All of us like sleeping, don't we? But the question is, in which resurrection will we wake up? Death is asleep for everyone, for the righteous and for the wicked. But there's a resurrection of life and there's a resurrection of damnation. 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 16 says, For the Lord Himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and with a trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. This is very, very clear, that the dead are going to be brought out of their tombs. These are those who knew Christ, who chose Him as their Savior and Lord. 1 Thessalonians 4.17 Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. So this is talking about the righteous. When Christ comes, the righteous dead come from their tombs and the righteous living are translated and we all meet Jesus in the air. But the other group, the wicked, when they see Christ come, this is not going to be a joyous event for them. This is a dreadful event. The Bible says in Revelation 20 verse 6, Blessed and holy is he who has part in the which resurrection? The first resurrection. You see, when you look at Revelation 20, we notice that there are two resurrections. Most people out there don't know this. One day I was speaking to a friend of mine a number of years ago and we started talking about this topic and she said, stop, stop. Just now you will convince me. Because you see, they ignore that chapter of the Bible. Many people say that Revelation is a closed book and no one can understand it, but it's actually a book that is for all of us to give us hope to live for the future. It's going to be wonderful. The first resurrection is where babies come from their tombs, placed in the mother's arms, reunited, where loved ones embrace each other. Families that were broken are now whole again. What a day that will be. That is the first resurrection. He has a little girl, four or five years old, coming from her grassy tomb into her mother's arms. Won't that be a wonderful moment? It's going to be glorious. It's something that, that I don't think any of us can really understand what that is. You know, there's joy when a baby is born, isn't it? There's a lot of joy and happiness. This is going to be a million times better because we know that there's going to be no sorrow from that point. It's just going to be happiness. Yes, friends, when Jesus comes, the righteous are going to say, this is our God. We have waited for Him. He will save us. This is our King. We've been longing to see Him. But sadly, 
Let me just go back for a moment. Sadly, there are others who are not going to be happy when Jesus comes. Now, you might ask me, um, what if I was married more than once in this life? And uh, what's going to happen in heaven? You know, that's a, a difficult question, isn't it? In fact, I spoke to a lady not too long ago. It was a few weeks ago. And this lady believed all the truth in the Bible. She accepted the message of Revelation. But she did not want to be baptized. Something was holding her back. And she was making many excuses. And as I was addressing every excuse, she eventually said to me, Do I have to be married to my late husband in heaven? So I said, um, No. She said, Okay, I'll be baptized. <laughs> Some people don't want to be married to their late husband or wife. You know, friends, we don't have all the answers. But the Bible does say when the Sadducees try to trick Jesus, because they did not believe in the resurrection. That's why they were sad, you see. The sad, you see. They did not believe in the resurrection. And they tried to trap Jesus saying, if this you know, person was married to so many, and who's, gonna, who's the person going to be married to in the resurrection? The Bible says there's going to be no marriage or giving in marriage in heaven. But one thing is for sure. Heaven is going to be a place of incredible love. Love will fill our hearts and our love needs will be met. You don't have to fear. Heaven will be a happy place. All your love needs will be met. And the question tonight is, can I trust God enough that I believe He will fill every one of my needs? Do I trust Him enough? Don't be like that lady and put off your salvation because you're worried, are you going to be married or not in the resurrection? One thing is certain. In eternity, God Himself will meet all our needs. Because God is what? Love, isn't He? God is love. There are two groups when Christ comes. There are the saved and there's the lost. Those who are happy when He comes and those who are terrified when He comes. Revelation 6 verse 15 to 7, He describes the people like this. And the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave and every free man hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of Him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of His wrath has come and who is able to stand? Can you see the two groups? The one group says, This is our God. We have waited, we, waited for Him. He will save us. And the other group says, we need to hide from Him. We need to run away from Him. We need to flee from Him. Yes, friends, we need to choose tonight in which group do we want to be in. Do we want to be part of the group that welcomes Jesus? Or are you part of the group that says, no, it's too hard to follow the Lord. I don't want to be obedient to Him. I would rather do what I want to. Yes, friends, it's the choices we make today that will determine our eternal destination. Yes, the wicked are consumed by the brightness of His coming. You know, it's so amazing. The one group, that brightness enshrouds them and they are translated. The other group are destroyed by that very same brightness. They say that the rocks must fall on them. They're hiding in holes and caves. If you do not crown Him as King of your heart now, you will run in fear then. If He's not sitting on the throne of your heart, now you will run from Him when He comes on His eternal throne then. What does it mean to accept Jesus as King? It means to invite Him to rule on the throne 
of your heart. He doesn't just want to be Savior. He wants to be Lord of your life, friend. He wants to direct every step of the way. He wants to be your everything. You know, when two young people are in love, they can't leave each other alone. And that love should burn in our hearts. That's the love that we should have for Christ. To spend as much time as possible reading the Bible. Take a Bible with you in the car. Wherever you go, take your Bible. Don't leave it at home. You know, I think many of us carry cell phones, don't we? You know, if only we can touch our Bibles as much as we touch our phones. If only we'll page through our Bibles as much as we page through our phones. If only we'll talk to the Lord and send messages to Him as much as we use it on our phones. That's a big thought to think about. 2 Thessalonians 1 verse 7 to 9 And to give you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus reveal, revealed from heaven with His mighty angels in flaming fire taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. So the, the gospel is something that we need to obey. He says, if you love me, keep my commandments. And you know, those commandments set us free. We are free when we keep the commandments in Christ's strength. These shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power. This is talking about the wicked. When Christ comes, they will be destroyed. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of His mouth and destroy with the brightness of His coming. This brightness that brings deliverance to the saints, to those who are waiting for Him, will destroy those who have disobeyed Him and rejected Him. Yes, friends, Jesus coming as King of kings and Lord of lords. And only if He's sitting on the throne of your heart will you be able to welcome Him. You can't say, well, I'm going to put it off, I'm going to put it off, I'm going to put it off. And at that moment, try and accept Him. Then it's too late. It's going to be too late then. Yes, friends, the righteous dead are going to come forth from their graves. The righteous living are going to be translated. But the wicked will be slain by the brightness of His coming. And the wicked dead remain dead in their graves. They are not resurrected during the first resurrection. Jesus invites you to make Him your Lord, your Savior, your King. Is He King of your life tonight? Or is He just like a spare wheel? You know, when you have a flat tire, then you go and check, is there a spare on this car? And often you find that the spare is flat, isn't it? Jesus doesn't want to be the spare wheel in your life. He wants to be the steering wheel. He wants to be in control of your life. And Jesus says, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. That where I am, there you may be also. Who of you wants to live with Christ eternally? Let me see your hands. Do you want to live with Jesus forever and ever? I do. That's my desire. I want to live with Jesus forever. It doesn't say He's maybe going to come, or He might come, or it's possible that He will come. He says, I will come again. He's not coming as a little baby born from a virgin. He's not coming as a little child wrapped in swaddling clothes there in the manger of Bethlehem. No, He is coming as the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the Savior of mankind. He's not coming secretly. He's coming publicly. Everybody will know that Christ has come. Revelation depicts Him on a white horse. Why on a white horse? A horse of victory. 
He's coming victorious. Now I saw heaven open and behold a white horse. And he who sat on him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood and his name is called the word of God. And the armies of heaven clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Yes, friends, Christ is coming victoriously as a mighty general, the leader of the hosts of heaven. Do you want to be ready? Do you want to be there and welcome him? You know, friends, it's a, the artists try and depict it, but you know the brightness of Christ, his glory outshines the noonday sun. We cannot look at the sun when it's at its full strength. And Christ is brighter than that. It's going to be a glorious moment when Jesus appears. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations. What is this talking about? In Hebrews, it talks about the word of God is sharper than a two-edged sword. Yes, the word of God is going to judge the nations. And he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. One night, one of these um, rock band singers, many years ago on the television, I saw, you know, these people, they've got these lights going, and you see the people's hands, and these people on the stage with their guitars, and you might have seen something on the TV like this before. It's like this total chaos. And people are virtually worshipping these musical artists. And this one lead singer took uh, a cup and he, and he spat in this cup. And then he sent it around through that audience. And people are drinking, smoking, using drugs. And everybody spat in this cup. And eventually it came back to the stage. And it was, you know, going like this. And that lead singer took it and he drank it. Now, friends, the way you feel right now is the way God feels about sin. God cannot tolerate sin. When He comes, sin is going to be destroyed. And everyone who is clinging to sin will be destroyed with it. It's like a hand grenade. You know, the pin has been pulled. If you hold on to it, what's going to happen? It's going to destroy you, isn't it? You know why they throw like this and not like this? It's to get the maximum length away from you because if it blows, at least there's this distance. It will only take your arm and maybe not your body. That's why they throw like this. Sin, we must get out of our lives, friends. Ask Jesus to come and save you, deliver you from sin, those evil habits, those thoughts that plague you. Give them to Christ. Ask Him to cleanse you. Spend time with Him every day. And then we will welcome Him as King of kings and Lord of lords. Let's quickly look at the events at Christ's coming. The believers are resurrected. The believers receive immortality. The wicked living are consumed. The wicked dead remain in their graves. The believers ascend to heaven with Christ. That's what happens when Jesus comes. But there's many questions that people are asking. What happens after Christ comes? What is the condition of the earth? What happens to Satan? When does God make the earth new? Is anyone alive on the earth during the thousand years? These questions are all answered in the book of Revelation, especially chapter 20. Let's have a look. You see, after, in, in Revelation 19, he's coming victoriously on that white horse. And this is the very following portion of Scripture. So after Christ comes, what happens then? Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. He laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. 
This is where the term millennium comes from. The word millennium is not used in the Bible. It comes from two Latin words, milli and annium, meaning thousand years. So the word millennium does not occur in Scripture, but thousand years does. But it comes from the Latin words milli and annium, to make millennium. What is this bottomless pit? Is it this subterranean cavity in the earth? The word used is abusos. Tonight I'm going to teach you a little bit of Greek. Let's say abusos. One more time. Abusos. Excellent. So this is the word that's used for, a, for bottomless pit. It's the word in English, the abyss. You've heard of the abyss? That comes from the word abusos. Now when the Bible describes the earth in a state of chaos, remember before God started creating and bringing order to the planet, in Genesis 1-2, it says, The earth was without form and void. That term there, without form and void, is abusos. Abusos. When Christ comes, this planet is going to be turned upside down. The islands are going to disappear. Buildings are going to crash. I'm sure mountains are going to be moved. It's going to be a terrible, terrible thing that happens to this planet when Christ comes. It's going to be havoc and confusion, destruction, wherever you look. Yes, friends, when Jesus comes to claim His children... With it comes the destruction of this planet. The wicked living are destroyed. The wicked dead remain in their graves. And everything else is flattened. Yes, friends, there's going to be earthquake and fire. Not one building will remain standing after Christ has come. The earthquake is the greatest earthquake that this planet will ever see. And what's going to happen? The place is going to be desolate, destroyed. This whole planet will be a desolate destruction. What are these chains that bind Satan? Does this angel have this big thick chain with a viro lock on it? Coming to tie Satan up. We've got you at last. Do you think it's possible to die, tie Satan with a, a, a chain? We have to now investigate what is this chain. Second Peter 2 verse 4. For if God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell, and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment. What type of chains? Chains of darkness. You see, Satan is chained by chains of darkness all around him is going to be destruction, desolation, death, no life. He has a thousand years to think about his rebellion. Remember there in the Garden of Eden, he said to Eve, don't believe God, believe me, you will not surely die, remember? And what happened? From that time all the way down right to today, People are dying on this planet. He said to the angels, before he was kicked out of heaven, he said, listen to me, my government is better than God's government. God is unjust, God is unfair. Follow me and you will have life. You know, friends, everything God does is to ensure the security of the universe for eternity. Many people ask, why is the planet left like this? Why is it in a state of chaos? And, and why does God permit this to happen? You see, everybody must see the unfallen worlds, the angels must see that Satan's rebellion brought death, destruction. But God, His way, is best. God is love. 
God is worthy to be trusted. Do you trust God with all your life? Do you really trust Him? When this planet went into rebellion, Jesus gave Himself to save us. Why did Jesus have to suffer so? So that everyone can see what is the result of sin. What did sin do to the innocent Son of God? Yes, Satan will have the words of Scripture echoing in his mind. The wages of sin is death. Him and his evil angels, the demons that have plagued this planet for so long, have a thousand years to think about their sin. It's like sitting on death row. They have a long time to think about everything that they have done. Yes, what they've done to you and to me. What they've done to our families, our friends, our loved ones. They have a time to think. The wages of sin is death. Is there anyone alive on earth during the millennium? We know that the graves of the wicked dead remained closed. And the wicked living were destroyed. They were annihilated by the brightness of his coming. So is there any person alive on the planet? No one is alive during the thousand years. Jeremiah 4 verse 23 to 27. I beheld the earth and indeed it was without form and void. And the heavens, they had no light. There's that word again. Without form and void. Abusos. This is not talking about the state of the planet when it was created. No, this is talking about the future. I beheld the mountains and indeed they trembled. And all the hills moved back and forth. I beheld and indeed there was no man. And all the birds of the heavens had fled. I beheld, and indeed the fruitful land was a wilderness. And all its cities were broken down at the presence of the Lord by His fierce anger. For thus says the Lord, the whole land shall be desolate, yet I will not make a full end. This is the condition of the planet when Christ comes. After He comes, there's going to be no life. But why does it say he will not make a full end? Because out of the ashes of this planet he's going to recreate. He's going to make a new heavens and a new earth. That's the good news. Yes, friends. There are no funeral undertakers to bury the dead that are slain when Christ comes. No one will be able to bury these corpses. They will cover the earth the new Jerusalem is going to descend at the end of the thousand years the capital of the universe is moving to earth isn't that incredible you know we are call it the black sheep of the universe at the moment we are the planet in rebellion but because of the blood of Jesus that was shed on this planet, heaven is coming down to earth. And this is going to be the capital of the universe. God is going to live here. Isn't that amazing? It's incredible. Jeremiah 25 verse 33. And at that day the slain of the Lord shall be from one end of the earth even to the other end of the earth. This is talking about when Christ comes the first time. They shall not be lamented or gathered or buried. They shall become refuse on the ground. Why are they not buried? Because there's no one to bury them. The righteous have all been taken to heaven. Some people say, no, but, but don't we rule here on the earth for a thousand years? The word of God says that we are caught up in the sky. Taken with Jesus to the heavenly temple. To the new Jerusalem. That is our destination. None of the righteous are going to rule over anyone. Because it's just corpses here. 
There's no one to rule over. Yes, the only one that will be here is Satan, the originator of sin and rebellion, the enemy of God, and the one-third of the angels that rebelled with him. They will be his company throughout the thousand years. One wonders what they will talk about, what they're going to think about, because they're going to be surrounded by darkness, no light, death, destruction, no flowers, no seasons of spring and life for a thousand years. This just utter desolation. Friends, love brings life. Selfishness brings death. This is the choice that you and I need to make tonight. Do I want to follow a loving Jesus? Or am I more concerned about my selfish will? In this life. Revelation 20 verse 6. Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection over such the second death has no power. So now we must hold on to our seats because it talks about a first resurrection and a second death. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. And I saw thrones, because some will ask, how do we reign? Here's the answer. And I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. Friends, during the thousand years up in heaven, every question will be answered by God. Every single question. You know, when, when we come into the kingdom, I'm sure there's going to be questions. Why is so-and-so not here? Why is my brother not here? Why is my father not here? Why is my daughter not here? I thought that they were walking with you, Jesus. But Jesus will show them, show us that he tried everything in his power to save that person. But they rejected him. I'm sure Stephen, the first martyr, is going to have a very big question when he comes into heaven. Because he's going to see Saul of Tarsus there. And what is Saul of Tarsus doing here? Because he was persecuting the church. Then Jesus says, come. I don't know if it's going to be a DVD or what. He said, let me show you. And there is the Damascus road and, and Saul falling off his horse. And he becomes Paul, the great apostle. And there goes Stephen and he embraces his brother. He said, I'm glad that we can be here together. Isn't that going to be a wonderful moment? When all our questions are answered. Even if you've got a million questions, Jesus will answer every single one of them. Yes, friends, the books of record will be given to us to study. To even see Satan, his rebellion, his fall. Cain, the antediluvian world, right through history, we can study every case. We're not going to be sitting up there playing harps. There's a lot to do in the thousand years. Every question about his justice and love will be fully answered. We'll even look at the case of Judas Iscariot, this man who was with Jesus for more than three years. And how he went wrong. It's going to be incredible studying the books of record. One of my friends said, Oh, he's worried about this because people are going to see what he did. I said, My friend, just make sure you are there. And then you don't have to worry because those who are there, their sins have been blotted out. Amen? That's good news. So make sure you're there and nobody will be studying your record. 1 Corinthians 6 verse 2 and 3. Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? Do you not know that we shall judge angels? This is talking about Lucifer. And one third of the angels that fell. We are going to look at that case. Did God act justly? 
This is the question. Is God just? 1 Corinthians 4 verse 5, Therefore judge nothing before the time, until the Lord comes, who will both bring to light the hidden things of darkness and reveal the counsels of the hearts. Then each one's praise will come from God. Yes, friends, we will be able to look at every minute detail. We'll see how Jesus tried his best to save every individual, but it was because of their personal choice that they were lost, not allowing him to be Lord of their lives. So let's have a review of the events during the millennium. The righteous are in heaven. The wicked remain dead. Satan and, an and the angels are bound on earth with a chain of circumstances. You know, if somebody phones you, say, no, I can't come, I'm tied up at the moment. Does it mean you're literally tied up somewhere? No, tied up by circumstances. I can't come now, I'm tied up. Satan is bound by circumstances. The earth remains desolate. No life. Now the question is, what happens after the millennium? Isn't this an exciting topic to look at? This is really a wonderful topic to study. Go back tonight and read Revelation 20. It will really inspire you. At the end of the millennium or the thousand years, the wicked dead are resurrected. Revelation 20 verse 5. But the rest of the dead, this is talking about the wicked. Remember when Christ comes, the first resurrection, blessed and holy is He who has part of the first resurrection over them. The second death has no power. But the rest of the dead, this is talking about the wicked, did not live again until when? Until the thousand years were finished. This is important. So by implication, they live again at the end of the thousand years. So here we have two resurrections. The resurrection of life. You have the thousand years and the resurrection of damnation. Are we together? Over here, people are dying. The first death. It's called a sleep. Remember last night's lecture? Death is a sleep. Those who died in Christ will be resurrected in the resurrection of life. Here, the wicked dead are resurrected at the end of the thousand years. And now we're going to see that they will be destroyed. That is called the second death. So this is the first death, first resurrection. Second resurrection, Second death. Are we together? Alright, this is very crucial for us to understand. And now I'm going to give you a bonus. Quickly, the judgment has three phases. There's the pre-millennial phase, there's the millennial phase, and there's the post-millennial phase. How many phases? Three. This we call the investigative judgment. This one we call the revelatory judgment. And this one here we call the executive judgment. And the big question, is God just? That's the question. Satan asked this one. Now, in the first phase of judgment, who can see that judgment? That's the judgment that we saw in the one lecture started in 1844 when Christ went into the most holy place. Remember? Remember? The angels can see that judgment. So after looking at that judgment, what do the angels say? God is just. Here, the righteous are in heaven. The books are given to them. And what do the righteous say? God is just. And here, after the wicked are resurrected, before they are destroyed, they also say, God is just. Isn't that exciting? Don't forget what I told you tonight. 
This is very, very important biblical truth. Very, very important. And those who are lost, according to Revelation 20 verse 8, their number is as the sand of the sea. Those are sad words. When the Lord comes down with the holy city at the end of the thousand years. Remember at the beginning of the thousand years, Jesus comes with the clouds and we meet him in the air. At the end of the thousand years, he comes down with a new Jerusalem and then the wicked are resurrected. And Satan gathers all his wicked followers and they say, let us attack the holy city. Now when the thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations. There's the answer in the verse. How is he released from the prison? Because remember the other dead did not live again until the end of the thousand years. That means they woke up, the wicked. Now he is loosed because he's got people to tempt again. Are we together? So he goes to deceive who? The nations, those who have listened to him all their lives, they just listen to that same voice again. They know that voice. Which are in the four corners of the earth. And John writes in Revelation 21, Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. This is the New Jerusalem coming down. Beautiful. Beyond comprehension. The city of gold coming down and... and in Zechariah it says that it's going to come down where the Mount of Olives is. It's amazing where Christ ascended from. In Acts chapter 1, that's where he went up. After the thousand years, the new Jerusalem is going to settle there. It's going to split open and become a plain. And that's where the capital of the universe is going to be. There's no hope in the old Jerusalem, friends. I've been there. There's no hope and happiness there. They will try and rob you there. One of my friends, they, they try to mug him. Right there at the garden tomb. There's no hope in the old Jerusalem. We have to wait for the one that comes after the thousand years. Yes, Satan and his evil host want to attack the holy city. Jesus will either be Lord of all, or not Lord at all. You can't have Jesus just a little bit Lord of your life. It's Lord of all or not Lord at all. Are we together? We can't just keep the, com the commandments that are convenient to us. You know, if you've got a house with, with ten doors, imagine in your, in your mind, ten doors. Here in South Africa, how many of those doors must, be, must you lock? You must lock all of them, isn't it? You must go and check. They're all closed. Because if you leave one open... They're going to come in there, isn't it? So how many of the commandments must we keep? All ten. You can't just sin in the one area because Satan will take control there. If you are committing adultery, he will take full control of your life. That's what he does. Revelation 21 verse 3. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men and he will dwell with them. And they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. Isn't this wonderful? Something to look forward to. That God is living here amongst his people. You know that the Old Testament, we have the tabernacle. It was pitched in the middle. And all Israel camped around the tabernacle. It's going to be so wonderful. You know, for us to go up every Sabbath and worship there in the New Jerusalem and who's going to stand there? The one with the nail-pierced hands. He's going to lead the service. Amen? That's something to look forward to. The new Jerusalem, beautiful city, coming down, adorned as a bride for her husband. The city with the streets of gold. Revelation 20 verse 9. They went up on the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. Now this is important. You're either going to be in the city or you're going to be outside the city. There's just two groups. There's two groups when Christ comes. Those who meet Him in the air and those who are dead on the earth. The end of the thousand years, you either are 
inside with Jesus or you with Satan on the outside. And you know what is one of the greatest disappointments, if not the greatest disappointment that a person can have, is when you think that you're going to wake up and see Christ coming on the clouds and you wake up from your grave and you see the holy city descending. You realize that you're a thousand years late. You thought that God will overlook that little secret sin of yours. You know, like Gehazi. Remember, he, he, he just wanted a little bit of that stuff of Naaman. Remember? And then the sin was found out and he became leprous. Remember that story? Friends, don't let even a little sin take control of your life. Don't permit any sin in your life. It will take full control of your whole being. They went up on the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints in the beloved city. And then the Bible says, And fire came down from God out of heaven, and what? Devoured them. You must come on Sunday. The lecture on the lake of fire. We're going to answer all your questions there by God's grace. But before this happens, Then I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. Remember I said that's the third phase of the judgment. It's the executive judgment, also called the great white throne judgment where Christ is on His throne. The righteous are in the city. The wicked have surrounded the city. Every single person who has ever lived is awake at that moment. It's quite a big moment, isn't it? Satan and his evil host on the outside. And then, in panoramic view, all of the wicked will see their lives, how Christ endeavored to save them. And how they rejected him over and over again. And according to Philippians chapter 2, it says that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Christ is Lord. That's when it happens. Yes, even Satan will bend the knee. Not because he loves Jesus, but because he acknowledges that God is just. God is just. Yes, friends, the choice is yours. The choice is mine. On which side do I want to be that day? I want to be part of the first resurrection. I want to be part of those who are inside the city when the new Jerusalem descends. How about you? The entire universe in symphony of praise declares, Just and righteous are thy ways, O God. This is what everyone will say. Just and righteous are thy ways, O God. Revelation 21 verse 1. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first, heaven, first earth had passed away. Also there was no more sea, no more separation. 2 Peter 3 verse 10, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Take note, He's coming as a thief. It's the timing. See? But not the way. Because when He comes, it, there's fervent heat, isn't it? Now let's quickly review the events at the end of the millennium. Christ, the saints, and the city descend. The wicked dead are raised. Satan is loosed from his chains of circumstance. The last judgment, the executive judgment, the great white throne judgment. Satan and sinners are destroyed after they acknowledge that God is just. The earth is cleansed and renewed. And then God makes everything perfect. 
we're going to see with our own eyes how God recreates this planet. Yes, friends, you and I can be there. As sure as you are sitting on that seat tonight, you can have the assurance that your life is hid with Christ in God. 2 Peter 3.13 Nevertheless, we, according to His promise, look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. I want to live there. How about you? I'm tired of the, the, the sadness and the sickness and the, the death and the crime and the fear that we have every day. The uncertainty. It doesn't get better, does it? Every government promises something better. It just goes worse. The earth is waxing old like a garment. Yes, friends, people from every nation, kindred, tongue, and people will be in God's kingdom one day. There's no excuse. Jesus died for each one of us. He paid the price for you. He paid the ransom for you, my friend. And He wants to come and fetch you when He comes. Don't let anything stop you from, come, from being ready when He comes. Don't let any sin stand between you and Jesus. Don't allow anything to withhold you from being ready.